So Hello. Go again, but I can't so, I said that I would um, make so for you so a video on context for Milton. Yes. And I'm making it now. I'm doing it. I'm double doing it. I'm sitting in my living room in my pyjamas. And I'm joined by the right honourable, venerable... <laughs> Dominic Birch, <laughs> hi. Who is um, currently? Uh, well, why don't you tell us what you're doing? Why don't you tell us your background very briefly and your connection to Kiwi? Okay. Uh, well, I was um, a student at Kiwi too long ago. I uh, taught uh, a bit at Kiwi um, on Fridays for. Th Three, three years, um, and I'm currently doing a PhD at King's College London in um, history, uh, specifically the early, the early modern period, which is uh, Milton's period, so I know some things, yeah. some contextual things. So basically, I have bribed Dominic uh, with homemade pizza and wine, and he's going to talk us through some of these ideas. So, if we start with... Let's just really briefly go back over what we mean by context. And it's anything that's about the influences and events and, and everything that's going on, usually in the, the writer's background. It can be other things because, of course, if we think about when a text is written as being different from when a text is read, then our own context are going to influence this. But for the purposes of this little presentation, we're going to think about what was Milton's life like? What was going on in his world? And how is that reflected in Paradise Lost? So, da -da, here I am. Here's a picture of me on my Hindu last year. You can see my mum directly above me, one of my best friends to the left, and my Auntie Wendy. If So I'm going to use this just to think about what are like the context that made Julie, the book, like, if you wanted to understand me as a text, what would you need to know about my upbringing and what happened in my life? So here I am, five years old. How cute was I? What a fringe. They say I don't rock a fringe, but I think they're wrong. So here is, you can see, here are some obvious things about me that would really help you understand the book of Julie. Um, raised by a single parent in a council house. Always, always loved books, just forever. Um, and I've just written there, poor. I was poor, as Dominic would say, poor. Um, and, and I was, or we were as a family, but I was very, very loved. And then, like, bigger things, what can I remember or what was important is I grew up under the Thatcher government. I grew up under that um, austere period where things where where government were not really that interested in how you could raise a child to make them a good human for society. Um, and one of the big conflicts going on in my periphery all the time were the conflicts to do with the IRA, and that went right through into my teens. And in fact, even when I was doing a um, my teacher training, I studied with a girl who um, whose hometown in Orma. Um, she'd been uh, the Orma was was a town that was the center of which was blown up by the IRA. So that things were very very near, but most importantly, it was free for me to go to university. I walked out of university with a bit of an overdraft and um, a bit of debt, but I did not have getting on for thirty grand's worth of tuition fees. God. Um... You imagine that? Yeah, imagine. Imagine, Christ. what a great feeling. Okay, <laughs> so what Okay, so what does any of that mean? It means that all of these things meant that I have always valued education. It, it's turned me into a socialist. It means that I've, well, in later life, become a feminist. I certainly wasn't one growing up. I didn't even know what the word meant. It means that I really value my family, uh, that I give to charity because I, one of my mantras is there's always somebody worse off than me um, and I still love reading so we've I've done a little bit of writing there that how you could incorporate it so that you could literally replace Milton's upbringing not on a council estate actually <laughs> actually from a pretty privileged background um, 
So th- my upbringing has influenced me in a certain way. And I've, I've put there as well about the limitations. It does mean I that I try and like spoil my own kids a little bit because I'm very conscious of what I what I didn't have. Mm. So does, does that make sense to you, Dom? Yes, it absolutely makes sense. <laughs> um, I, well, something I... Oh, yeah. It terrifies me that uh, the people reading this will not remember 9-11, because that's, like, my growing-up context. Right. Yeah, they'll know of it, but they won't remember yeah. it. Yeah. Things move very quickly, don't they? Yes. So, so in, in a very real sense... Is that something you remember? Is that something oh, yeah. that has influenced you? Yeah, I mean, both. I remember it. And, you know, you, I, I think people of my generation are the ones who were, like, coming of a kind of into consciousness when 9-11 and the war on terror happened. So I mm. think, like, you know, it's something that we would always kind of think about and that's a lens through which we would be the one. Yeah. Yeah, so, so for my students now, in 2020, what are their... You've got Greta Thunberg and yeah. climate change. You know, you're living through the Donald Trump oh, <laughs> era. You are massively being affected by Brexit, mm. whether whatever your views are on it. So just so, so think about your own lives and about when you write the book of you in 10, 20, 30 years time, what, what are those what are those things that, that affect you? You know, if the election had gone differently before Christmas you might be heading, you might have been heading to university for free. That's, you know, things, things like that. How does that make you feel? Um, So what we're going to do is try and move it away now from me, which I know is very difficult, (laughs) and talk about Milton. Um, So these are our, do you love the quality of my slides? (laughs) They're just beautiful. (laughs) You know what? They're functional. Um, so, like, Anna Beer's uh, biography of Milton is well worth a read. It's very accessible. And the In Our Time um, show on BBC Radio 4, hosted by Melvin Bragg, uh, is it's only about half an hour as well. Um, and there's loads of stuff that you can get on that. And interestingly, how the two of them, in terms of your, like, AO3, AO5 sources, are often in disagreement so it's a good reminder, a new history students who also do literature will know that it's about trusting the veracity of your sources as well. So let's just remind ourselves of our dual coding. Remember I've said that at the start of the exam, you've got eight images for each text because there will be an Ibsen follow-up on this. And before you even look at the questions, I want you to recall these images to mind Um it won't surprise Dom to know that we've actually put a soundtrack to this. Um, uh, I, I, I won't. I won't do it now. But uh-huh. um, the one for Ibsen is. Um, it's it's basically songs and images. So when we do the angel in the house, there's some posturing and oh, that kind good. of thing. We, we like this. Yeah. yeah. So um, remember, we've got Puritanism, divorce, the epic, hit religion, pamphlets free speech, republicanism, and the civil war. You two can keep talking, by the way, in the background. You, no, you, we're just fascinated by it. Yeah. So, so Dom's fiance <laughs> Charlie, is with us, and my husband is in the background, and, um, and they might chip in yes. with some, yes, please, with some knowledge. A collaborative adventure we're going yeah. on. And, we've, and, and our soundtrack is um, First Aid Kit, if you're thinking... Oh, those songs in the background. (laughs) Nicely, (laughs) nicely helping. Right, so remember, dual coding, get that down. But what you've been saying to me constantly is, how do I I blend this in? How do I make this help me with an essay? Right, so, pamphlets, free speech. Uh, Do do you want to start? Do you want me to lead you in? I think you should, yeah, because I'm, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what you want me to say. Okay, so... Did Milton believe in free speech and the writing of... Uh, um, yes and no. It's like anything. Um, it's a yes, but. So I'll, Milton knew from an early age that he had a calling, a vocation to be 
um, a poet and to, to speak for his country. And that might sound really weird, but but at that time, that was kind of it was almost like fair enough. That's how people might respond to what's happening in their era. Um, they would do it through through writing. Um, pamphlets at the time were a bit like the, the Twitter or Instagram of, yeah. of now. Yes, so like pamphlets are very new and um, it's like it's very uh, fiery and polemic. If you've got a point to make, you'd print a pamphlet. Because of the publishing, because, that, because of publishing becoming easier. Yes, and you can then uh, spread it across, mostly across London, um, other big cities, and that's how you would make your, get your political point to people that aren't yeah. just... They were cheap to publish. Yes. Someone, you would, you would get a print run, and literally somebody would stand and hand them out. Yeah. Um, and it was, they, they were like the forerunner of newspapers, yes, really, weren't definitely. they? definitely, but a lot cheaper. Yeah, I yeah. think Instagram, Twitter is a good example, is a good idea. Yeah. Because you, you are reaching people at this point that you are not, you haven't been reaching before. Yeah, Milton would be, like, the, the term, an influencer, he, he definitely would have been. Again, listening to the In Our Time, looking at the uh, at the book, there's some kind of discrepancies about how influential he was. But if you certainly look at the print runs he had for his um, publications, they were pretty sizable. You know, he's not, we're not talking about he prints off 50. Think, we're talking about print runs in the hundreds and then in the thousands. Yeah, I mean, I also think, like... Um... It's important as well that he is just really hooked into the conversation that's going on. So it's like any kind of big topic that's uh, relevant in this period, Milton will have had a, an opinion on and yeah. will have probably published on it as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. He's, he's had a very privileged, educated background at this point. His, his father has been very invested in his education. Um, they live... I mean, London isn't the London that we know now, but they live kind of around the area as well at this point where it was easy to get access to printed material. Mm -hmm. And that, that thing there, the first tract given to the Bodleian Library, that what does that mean? It, uh, it means that he was incredibly invested in his legacy and posterity as a writer. So everything that he wrote... He sent a copy of to the Bodleian yeah, for them to keep. Yeah, he's like so conscious of his place as a writer, his place in the tradition. Uh, so I mean, we're not talking about here, but you know the reason he's writing the epic uh, is because it's really important to him as a poet because he wants himself to be seen up there with you know Ovid, Virgil, Homer. Mm. Um, and you know those are <laughs> it's not a small aspiration in terms of what he's doing writing. Yeah. Like, there's a big people yeah. you want to join. Yeah. The the, the big they're the big hitters. Yes. Um and and he, and we, I knew this would happen, we jump around all over. But mm. um even in that epic how he claims that he will justify the ways of God to man. Yes, I know it's not, it's not <laughs> so not, small. It's like, <laughs> let me tell you yes. what's what's going on. Um so uh, what I've written here about the court of the Star Chamber abolished, there was basically there was lots of censorship and um, it, it wasn't it wasn't easy to print stuff. But in 1641, this court of the Star Chamber, which uh, basically affected a lot of the censorship, w was abolished. So it meant that lots of things could then be printed. I mean, it would be reestablished later. It's not there all the time. Um, but when he writes of Reformation, that's a longer title than that, in 1641, he's interested already in how best to reform what he saw as a corrupt church, as the bishops, he hated the bishops, they had too much influence in how the country was being run and he wanted that absolutely gone and uh, Anna Bia refers to him here as this manly Christian Matt Milton had found his voice, so he'd, he'd found his cause, he'd found what he was interested in, um, and it's all to do with this idea of um, free will, of, of independence, and of not being dictated to. By... Yeah, and I think, um, you know, so there's firstly, like, uh, a question of religion in this period is always a question of, of politics. Uh, you can't, and like the Catholicism issue is such an issue because the essential charge against Charles the First is that he's too Catholic, too Catholic for the Church of England. So, uh, suddenly wanted to say I'm 
to Catholic from, oh my from my country yes. to Catholic from. <laughs> Um, Sorry. <laughs> well, am I going to remember that? Um, <laughs> Charles, too Catholic for his country. I should be on Horrible Histories. Yes, you should. <laughs> Where my friend now works. Um, oh, all right, name dropper. Uh, it's my friend, it's not me. <laughs> I did nothing. Um, I just took off her class when she left. Anyway, um, I. the point here, I think, is um, Paulus Lost is discussing at once politics and and religion um but they're like in everything he's saying about religion is is political and um you know the start the civil war is kicked off by what we um refer to as the bishops war about the power of bishops in scotland um and it it's not something that you can disentangle and i think it's really easy to see religion politics like separate it yeah really and you can't not... separate them you can't separate them now yeah. i mean talk to my students here as, as we look at the dystopian texts as we look at religion and politics and and you know access to women's bodies yeah you know in in 2020 um but it, it what in short you need to know is that those pamphlets gave him um a, a chance to practice his voice and his passion Although he's going to write Paradise Lost a couple of decades later, mm-hmm. they they gave and they gave him a public forum mm-hmm. as well. You, you know, you cannot underestimate how popular Paradise Lost was when it was first published, and then when it was republished with the um, like the little introductions. Yeah. Um, you know, it was it was, it was massive. Can right. I um, jump in to do a little um, cough? Yes. Yes. Um, no, a little. Uh, I was going to suggest that I do a little kind of um, sentence of uh, um, context and execution. Um, Do it. Okay, so something like, um, uh, Milton was an active pamphlet writer um, all his life, often engaging in um, in debates, uh, current debates over religion and politics. This uh, uh, practice writing pamphlets uh, gave him a voice in the polemic style that you see in Paradise Lost book 9 and 10. For instance, this isn't book 9 and 10, but when he says, um, I want to justify the ways of God to men. I think there you go. I've just, I've just added that for you, because then you're probably going to ask me, what does the polemic style mean? Oh, sorry, I didn't, just angry. Oh, do you see uh, my dressing gown clicked some spoilers there? Uh-huh. Right, cool. Excellent. Right, uh, we've run out of music. Um, can you, Alexa, play. Oh, what? what... Frightened Rabbit. Alexa, play Frightened Rabbit. Right. Right, divorce. Ah. Okay, here's the thing. Um, lots of you like to write in your essays. Milton was in favour of divorce. Like, the end, like it's a blanket statement. He was in favour of divorce in very, very strict, specific circumstances. And again, like, not divorce for everybody. Like, he wasn't He wasn't saying that women oh God, no, could no. initiate Jesus, divorce. can you imagine? Um, <laughs> and just with any of this, just think... Catholics no, because yeah. that that was the context, and you also all want to write about he had how he had an unhappy first marriage. Well, Anna Bea is a bit more um, skeptical of this idea of being unhappy. So yes, he was thirty three, she was seventeen. Yes, her family were uh, more royalist during the Civil War than, uh, and he obviously isn't royalist at all. Um, but it's not even so much those things that seem to make uh, make there be a problem in... Like, it was the default position for the majority of people in the country to be royalist. It, it just was. It was it was what they'd always known. So, actually, it's, it's Milton that's kind of the weird one. Milton's own brother was a royalist because to be other was, was to be really, really other. So this separation that they endured at the beginning of their marriage, uh, Beer argues, was much more exacerbated actually by the geography of the Civil War, that she was away in kind of Oxfordshire, which was heavily um, 
uh, royalist. royalist, and actually it was incredibly difficult for her to leave safely and get to London. So she argues that, look, we don't know a lot about this. Why do we instantly assume that she didn't want to be with him? So that's beside the point. I'm just saying that so that, so that you don't come across as just being really, like, he was in favour of divorce, the end. What yeah. he... Go on. I was just going to say, it's much better in an essay like this, I think, to find something that Milton has said about divorce, understand it and use that as context, rather than say, he had an unhappy marriage, he was in favour of divorce, yeah. therefore... Yeah, yeah, because actually, when she did return to him, you know, their marriage kind of rocked on, and it and it was fine, you know, they had children together... She unfortunately died um, uh, not long after giving birth to, I'm going to say their son? Yes. Um, so he had three daughters that survived, two from Mary and one from his second marriage. And again, with his second marriage, she died not long after yeah. the birth of Deborah. Deborah. Yeah. Um, so anyway, that... It, that's just me waffling. Dead wives aside. Dead wives, put aside. <laughs> the whole thing is, why does he argue for divorce? Because he sees marriage as a union that must enable the man to be the best man that he can be in society, serving society and serving his God. Now, if his wife doesn't enable him to do that in meet and happy conversation then there is a reason an argument there that you should get divorced let's think about that in paradise lost look at what happens when eve instigates the fall and adam is absolutely destitute you know they have sex it's all happy times and then in book 10 you know it, it goes to shit yeah basically so how do they but how do they reconcile? Do you remember it's that section where Eve actually falls at Adam's feet. She kisses his feet. She begs for forgiveness. And she basically says, I will now do whatever you want me to do to help. I'm paraphrasing, right? Mm -hmm. I know you're, now, right now you're thinking, why isn't Julie just giving us the quotations? Well, maybe because you can do some work yourselves. Once they have a discussion about and, and, and so, so Adam at this point, sorry, he starts to kind of regain his reason because Eve's suggestion, what does she suggest about what they can do? Adam's worried about his legacy into his children. At this point, there are no children, right? So purity of chastity over sexual activity. Um, there's lots to suggest that he wasn't all that interested in having sex, particularly with women. But for God's sake, don't go off on it. Milton was gay, as a as a line for your whole argument. As a gay man, please don't. <laughs> I don't want him. Yeah, no. yeah, yeah. You don't want him in your club. Yes. Is he is he is he, is he ousted? Um, so Eve Eve has two suggestions for this. Eve says, "Look, let's just not have any kids. Like we can't we can't pass on our sin if there are no children to pass it on to. Easy." And if you can't abstain from that, she says, you know what? Let's kill ourselves. Do you remember she says, let's, let's, because death is, is, a, is a character. Let's go and find death and let's take it into our own hands. And this is where Adam kind of comes back. So he's at least, even though it, to him, Eve isn't making good suggestions, they're still having what you might argue is a happy conversation. They're discussing things, they're talking, they are wrestling it out together. And he says, do you know what? Actually, I think that if we just plan to kill ourselves, I'm pretty sure God will have an answer to that. He's kind of seeing what's going on and he might call us on it. And I think what he'll call us on will be much worse. So do you know what, Eve? Let's let's look at it. What's happened? We thought we'd die instantly. Well, we haven't. Um, all you've got to do is have a bit of pain when you're giving birth. Not too bad. And me, I've got to labour for work. Well, actually, that's great because idleness is worse. So they start to have a conversation. They start to figure it out together. And that's, I'd rather you pursue that line 
when thinking about so that that's why Adam and Eve don't divorce in Paradise Lost because they wrestle and they work it out together you could argue but the, I guess the flip side of the argument is oh, that Eve is a bad look he's doing AO5 he's doing AO5 right now no yeah so is that Eve is is a bad wife in the in the Christian sense because she's uh, diverting Adam's ability to serve God by by you know by tasting the apple and uh, giving into Satan's uh, um, seductions, I guess. Um, I think there's an additional point of context here is that that is verbatim what happens in the Bible. Um, yes. So this kind of this is a point in the story in which Milton can't deviate from. Obviously, the conversation about let's kill ourselves is made up. Um, made up. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. But also, the I, I love the bit where after Eve's eaten the apple, she's like. Should I tell him? Yeah. Should I not? Mm, if I tell him, I could be more... Su- if I don't tell him, I could yeah. be more superior. Love that, more superior. Yes. <laughs> but if but if I don't, and then I'm killed, then he's yeah. going to get another wife. Yeah. And she's not happy about that. So yeah. e- either way, it's still... But I think... Um... I think uh, what I'm trying to say is that, like, if, if you are going to pursue the kind of pro-divorce Milton in this in in your analysis, the kind of thing here is that Eve is a problematic wife in the sense yeah. of distracting from uh, Adam's devotion to God. Yeah. Um, and what this leads to is in in the final book of Paradise Lost, which you know you're not studying is but but it's also context it's also context there's so much context here um is them leaving the garden and i forget the phrase but it's about them leaving hand, hand in, in hand, hand but still being lonely um so it's kind of they're lonely but but what but what milton gives them is they they look out yeah at the world and they see opportunity mm. yeah so it's complicated but the but there's mm. definitely a kind of rift in the marriage and a rift in the what the metaphorical marriage a rift in relationship and a rift in a kind of you know yeah. quite literally they've been divorced from but i like Eden. what you said there about eve being a problematic wife yeah. because that is and you can quote dominic birch is an <laughs> ao5 source there b-e-b-i-r-c-h there you go um mm-hmm. because nora is a problematic wife as well oh yeah great yes absolutely yeah well done there we go good lad good lad you <laughs> must have had a great teacher i know <laughs> um right let's talk about free speech and censorship um so yeah so was he in favor of free speech yes <laughs> but <Broadly. laughs> but um only for people who could handle it <laughs> yeah um, um, you see this a lot through history, it, you know, um, people who are who are lauded as advocates for like women's rights and free speech. You know, Virginia Woolf, she was a feminist, yeah, but not for like her cook, not for her cook, yeah, not for regular <laughs> women, uh, educated women, upper class women. So free speech, yes, definitely not for Catholics. We do not want any of those pesky Catholics spouting so, their ideas. Some of the kind of thing I think here is sorry, cool. um, is like. The idea of free speech, Milton, when he is writing about it, is very much writing about it in the context of debating positions within Protestantism. So it's like the free speech to argue about the direction of the Protestant church. But if you're Catholic, Jewish, Muslim, a woman, shh. Yeah, just be quiet. We we don't like this. (laughs) Yeah, we don't want to hear from you. Yeah. Um, So would you like to tell us a bit more about the Areopagitica. Okay, I, I can do this. Um, I am. Um, Go! So, this is a Milton's pamphlet. Uh, uh, why are your pyjama bottoms rolled up, by the way? I don't know, I'm just feeling very, like. Uh, Warm and hot and warm. cold. Yeah, just like, I don't know, like, like I feel like this is kind of like a pyjama punting look. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> Charles, you are still not married. You can still walk away. <laughs> he, he's, he's just referred to himself as wearing a pajama punting look <laughs> um, in January in Cockerton. <laughs> um, yes, um, so, Areopagitica. Yes, indeed. A word I can't say. So this is um, a, uh, one of Milton's pamphlets where he most famously argues for all free speech. Um, it's quite short. I. Um, I mean, honestly, just read the Wikipedia page. Um, 
much. I mean, read the whole thing. It's great. But um, uh, so you know, uh, Milton calls for the liberty to know, to utter, and to argue freely, argue, argue freely according to conscience above all liberties. That, that's a direct quote, um, and it still forms the groundwork for a lot of uh, modern day arguments about free speech. Um, now, the impl- the kind of um, implicit uh, subtext is always that it's limited in the ways that we said before, but there are. But he is making kind of strong arguments for free speech. <laughs> in they're talking about how much they fancy us when we found each other. <laughs> in this text. Um, Are you going to edit this at all? Nope. No. We're just giving it... Um, but there's a few different things what, about what this what this actually means in context. So firstly, it's you can't just say anything. It's about publishing. It's about... Um, it's about the kind of um, things that you're allowed to debate in the kind of public uh, realm in England. And it's coming directly out of Milton feeling unable to write about divorce. Um, again, in a Protestant context. Um, yeah, I think that's kind of roughly. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. Say. So how how are we how are we how are we making that talk to Paradise Lost? Okay, so I think for one thing, uh, Satan is a great orator in Paradise Lost, yeah. and I think you know uh, a lot of the kind of context here is about how. Uh, Milton is writing Satan yeah and the kind of argument here is I guess that Satan should be allowed to say these things and to have that discussion but not necessarily allowed to do what he's doing yeah yeah I I think you've absolutely hit the nail on the head there because what most um I, I was watching a little scene this morning from um from one of Ibsen's plays um I can't remember which one it was now because I was distracted by a small child but the guy comes in, the woman's been reading books. Uh, it's a very young Judy Dench. He comes and he says, oh my God, I can't believe you've been reading this. And she's like, well, it's just what people are reading in Europe, blah, blah, blah. And she's like, what do you think about these books? And he's like, well, I haven't read them. Mm-hmm. And the whole thing is like, people, it's 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 about shutting down debate. Mm-hmm. And so Satan is allowed to put his view forward so that you can reasonably, or use your reason, Yeah. To understand it and counteract yeah, it, very, it, it yes. ra- rather than somebody telling you, well, you don't need to know about it. Just trust me, it's bad. Yeah, Milton saying, no, actually, let's have imagine that in the modern day. Let's have a conversation. Can you imagine about it? Um, um, and I've put that thing in there about liberty, not license. And this is something that really struck me. I was listening to the In Our Time again as I was walking to work a couple of days ago. He's, he's not arguing that you should have complete license and freedom to say and do what you want. Again, everything has boundaries. Everything's limited. This is a world in which everything's limited. L- limited, limited. But what you should have is the liberty to use your God-given reason to argue things through. Mm-hmm. As long as you're a man okay. and not a Catholic. Yeah, I think um, kind of like on top of that, uh, it's the fact that women it's not only that women shouldn't have the liberty to use their reason it's that women are lacking in reason yeah yeah which they just can't do it which yeah but i think in the context of paradise lost it's the you know why is eve seduced by satan and adam isn't it's because she lacks the reason that would give her the ability to refute satan's arguments yes and Satan is also being very emotional to her rather than just yeah. kind of rational. But what's annoying about that is it's that, sexist that as well. it, it, not just that it's sexist, but that Eve is never actually given. This is one thing that we've talked about: is that Eve and Nora both lack education. Yeah, and Eve is is shut out from the conversations that um, Adam's having with Michael and so that Adam's on. having with Michael. Yeah. So basically, imagine if you'd let Eve in. Yeah, if you'd said, "All right, just sit there quietly." You mm-hmm. could listen, but don't say anything. Maybe she'd have been better prepared. Yeah. Because if you listen to Satan's arguments when he's persuading her to eat the apple, fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. He's like, well, I've eaten it. I'm not dead. Yeah. I was a snake and look at me. I can talk. And she's like, oh, wow. Mm-hmm. Imagine. Why, well, why shouldn't we do this? Mm-hmm. So it, it's a double-edged sword, isn't it, that Milton in saying, 
like women can't mm. and look how silly they are but he's almost shooting himself in the foot by saying yeah but you haven't you haven't given them a chance and Milton was also he'd written a pamphlet about education mm. and how boys need to be educated with his own children all three of his daughters could uh, they were very fluent in languages but not in understanding them yeah. just in translating them they were taught enough to be able to help him when he was yeah. blind translate things but not to understand uh -huh. so you can't escape that he was an absolute misogynist but you have to temper it a bit with him being a product of his time unfortunately well i mean it's so i um actually like what i would say here um oh. because uh because it's something you struggle with with anybody in this period um and is and you know just saying this is sexist doesn't get you anywhere um so what I will say, my supervisor, Laura, who is um, fantastic. Um, Laura who? Gowing. Laura Gowing? Yes. Um, uh, her book, Domestic Dangers, changed my life. Her Massive. book, Domestic Dangers, changed, my changed life. his life. Um, it, but, um, you know, she told me off about using the word sexist in my uh, dissertation. Um, and her central thing was, well, of course it's sexist. It's only about in England. Um, that doesn't help us do any analysis. Because, oh. um, you know, like, what, what are you meant to say? Like, you know, these arguments are always sexist and it's not about forgiving them because they're a product of their time. It's just, it's such an obvious thing to point out that there's almost kind of no, no point, point pointing Mo it move out. Move on and say something more interesting. Or, yeah, or just like, you know, in which case, like, what is the attitude to women? What do attitudes, mm. you know, like, that's a more interesting question and you don't need to tell us it's sexist. Um, cool. Anyway, yes. Good um, point, well made. I just want to kind of quickly say something about free speech as well. Yeah. Just like the idea of speech in Paradise Lost. Uh, so, you know, again, at the end, uh, all of the kind of um, the speeches that um, are being made by Satan and his contemporary, um, his other, the other fallen angels, are replaced with hissing. Um, and there's this very kind of like idea that that forum itself is kind of speech is banned there by God at the end. Um, oh, God, I never even thought of that. Um, <laughs> yeah, he literally doesn't let them speak. Yeah, so there's a kind of like, is in the context of Milton's views on free speech, is that a further defense of Satan? Or is that a kind of, um, is that an area... He's said which, enough. Yeah, is that the limit of free mm. speech? Ooh, see? Spicy. Spicy. <laughs> this, is what, this is why I invited him round. Right. Religion. Religion. Um, okay, so... I'm now regretting that I didn't at least put a colour on these slides, like... Well... Do you know what? It's the discussion. It's yeah. the discussion. <laughs> Right. Um, Religion. Um, okay. Go. So uh, <laughs> this is something I do know a decent amount about. Um, uh, so, is there any religion in Paradise Lost? Is there any religion in Paradise Cause Lost? Because that's what some of them will write. You, won't you? You would. You know who I'm thinking of. There is religion in Paradise Lost, and Milton was religious. You would fucking hope so. <laughs> um, Stop swearing, it's so, for students. Sorry. They're under 18, they've never heard these words before. Ah, okay, cool. So. Um, <laughs> Religion. Um, it's easy to get stuck in very kind of specific ways of thinking about religion. You know, nowadays it's, you know, we don't really distinguish between branches of Christianity that much, uh, unless you are of a certain kind of Christian persuasion, you hate everyone else. Um, but I want to kind of like <laughs> bring in a few kind of things that are being obviously discussed in Paradise Lost. So predestination is one. Uh, predestination is the idea that um, before you were born, you are um, essentially, you are either a good person or a bad person. You're one of the elect, um, on which means you're going to heaven or you're not. Uh, and then, you know, you live your life. And also the percentage of the people who are elect is tiny. Yeah, it's not it, it's, it's minuscule. Um, and so the idea... None of us in this room. No, definitely not me. Um, so you're, um, you're um, if you are elect, you're going to heaven, you're a good person and so on. Uh, this is a um, debate that is uh, massively raging when Milton is writing Paradise Lost. And um, because uh, that's kind of the view of 
Calvinism of um, something called Arminianism that nobody in the world ever needs to think about or understand, um, as opposed to the Catholic view, which is that um, we get into heaven through good works and then confessing our sins mm. and repenting and so on. Um, this... which, which is why, just as a side note, um, Hamlet's dad is a little bit annoyed that he yeah. was killed with all of his sins on his head. And yeah. that's why he's wandering had, around. Had he have had gone to confession, yeah. he'd have been that morning... And he just said, oops! Yeah, he'd have been much like. happier. Um, I think... Um, so predestination is really important for Paradise Lost because it is the constant uh, running refrain throughout that God has is that he knows that Satan is going to tempt Eve and Adam and they are going to fall. He has seen that coming and the kind of constant uh, battle in his mind is, um, oh, well, I know it's going to happen. Should I intervene and so on? And the um, uh, point that God comes up with to refute this is essentially that he has he has made humanity free and therefore free to fall. Uh, those are roughly his words. Um, and if were he to intervene or change anything, that freedom would mean less. Um, but he can so, still. So see what? It. So what value do you place on the freedom to make your own choices? Yes, but he still knows it's going to happen. So it's a bit complicated. Um, but um, the point I think here is that on predestination to Milton becomes a kind of literary device because everyone reading Paradise Lost knows how it's going to end um, because it's in the Bible, which they will have re had read to them every single week in church in English by this point. Everybody mm, yeah. knows how the story is ending. Yeah. It is predestined. Um, so... But the kind of interest of the story is how it happens, why it happens, and the debates along the way. And I think there's a kind of level there in which the kind of whole kind of act of writing and reading Paradise Lost itself is a kind of like way of kind of, um, you know, you choose to read it not because you want the kind of thriller. Um, yeah, plot. yeah, yeah. Yeah, this, um, is, this isn't the John Grisham. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's like... It's predestined to end that way, but the journey itself is important. Yes. And that journey perhaps should reflect your own journey that you're going through and the choices that you're making yeah. and how you're going to get to that end point. Um, so a couple of other things that we've got on there, um, because we haven't really touched much upon why Milton was such an advocate of republicanism. Uh -huh. um, and I'm aware that you've been listening for ages and we're running out of time. Uh, um, mainly because we've got a Jaws board game to play and more wine to drink. Um, so you know about the Divine Right of Kings. You've heard this from, like, GCSC. Um, um, so what we've got is Charles I on the throne. And you know what? He's the monarch. He was he was born into that position. And, and Milton and many others, and that's the important thing, uh, go, hang on is that is that cool like you should just be a king because you were born into that yeah. position um you should you well, should govern because you're the best person to govern not because you were born into being mm. the, also, uh, the governor like wider context here um very fertile time to be questioning this england is like england has gone you know since henry the eighth henry uh edward mary elizabeth James, Charles, like... Boom! <laughs> Just did it. He wasn't even looking on Wikipedia, guys. <laughs> uh, but, like, you know, half the time, that means the country's changing religion. Like, nobody, I think, is actually, other than Charles and James, under the illusion that anybody actually has a divine right to sit on the throne. I mean, a few people. But um, it's, like, such a time to really question that because they've seen bad rulers. And... So, what, so what was the problem with Charles? What was the problem with Charles? Okay, I'll be very quick. Too Catholic. Too Catholic. Um, Boo. Catholic wife. Uh, Catholic wife. Bad wife, yeah. Catholic wife uh, makes the uh, Church of England a lot more Catholic than it has been. He, at some point, was making a secret treaty as well. Yes, with uh, essentially not to go to war with Spain. Is that what we're... As long as... 
uh, the whole country became Catholic again. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, too Catholic, too spendy. Too spendy and not spendy uh, on the people. Not spendy on the people, spendy on himself, bankrupts every, everything, uh, puts a whole host of Please like... Please don't write too spendy in your essays. Please don't write too spendy, sorry. Um, <sighs> st- I'd, I'd love that I didn't have to say that. <laughs> stages a whole set of elaborate like court entertainments, but nothing for the people. Um, and just a bit kind of seen as a bit like up himself and not again don't like up himself um, um, see, arrogant arrogant self-serving self-serving does not disinterested disinterested in the... in in the country yes um and that and that is seen as a it's not only the country's right it's his role and responsibility as a monarch yeah. to do things like go on processions greet the public yeah. and so on um so uh, but it's mainly the kind of Catholic issue. That's the kind of big sticking point to which it all erupts into civil war, uh, which uh, uh, Milton is on the Republican uh, reformist side. Um, I mean, he does very well to survive it, really, yes. because he he works for Cromwell. He becomes... We keep, we keep changing our mind about what he is, but he's basically... Mm-hmm. Um, He's like a minister, the Minister for Foreign Tongues, something yeah, like something that like it's that, called. Yeah. Please don't quote me on that, I need to look it up. Um, mm. But he, he, he's an important, a really important person. Yeah. And it's because of his command of languages, yeah. uh, especially Latin. Uh, he's he, he's desperately important yeah. uh, in communicating with the rest of Europe. Still a very relevant language in this time. Yeah. Like you, anything official you write. In yeah, yeah. I was going to say that, that anything that's important, anything official, anything legal, yeah, is is in Latin. Um, but it is around this time that his eyesight is starting to fail, yeah. and that's another thing that any medical problems, um, any any issues. So I've said that he had three children. Uh, he had a son who died. These things were directly seen as a reflection on the man, on the husband, yeah. and on the person. You know, if, if you start to get ill, if you start to go blind, uh, that's God's punishment for something, for something. So that's it's all bound up in this idea that everything's re- everything's tied to religion and mm. what and the influence that God has on your life. Yeah, I am. Um, so, yeah, I think I, it's kind of interesting as far as Paradise Lost is concerned as well, because Satan is such an appealing kind of revolutionary and that's what uh people have so, oh this has one in it okay um, this is what people have read into uh into paradise lost is it's a de- it's a it's, it's that satan is is essentially right you know so the quote that, you know, is very famous, is from uh, William Blake, uh, Milton was on the devil's star side without knowing it. Because um, Satan is a very, like, appealing revolutionary figure. But I think it's kind of kind of interesting to say, like, I think a better reading of the context here is to say Milton was a Republican, yet still rejects Satan's Republicanism. Um... Um, yeah. For the simple reason that you cannot say that Satan was invested in the good of humankind. Yes. He wants a ruler who is going to rule in the best interests of the people. Yeah. And um, yeah, Satan's, Satan's not doing that. No. Also, like, kind of to complicate it a bit further, like, uh, Milton is a fan of Oliver Cromwell, who is a dictator. Uh, so it's, it, but that's complex, but yes, um, I think, yeah, I think it's too easy to kind of say, oh, Satan is defended by Milton, because he, he absolutely isn't. No, but in the spirit of free speech, you, you, you have to let people present their argument in order to knock it down. Yeah, we're happy Satan exists, but not necessarily happy that, but he's not right. Yes. Yes. Okay, I think... Yeah, so look forward to our next episode, which will be on Ibsen 
And then we might get onto Ibsen and Milton. Breakfast tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, over breakfast tomorrow. Right. Cool. We still recording. <laughs> oh, you. <laughs> oh, that quality outro. <laughs> <laughs> Eddie, it didn't work. Do you mean you've just done all of that?